Hello, everyone. I'm John McCutcheon. I'm part of the Chrome DevRel team. And my uh, focus is on making the web fast. And that's what I'm hoping to teach you today, how to make your page very fast with V8. So this talk's going to get into some pretty low-level details about how V8 works and how you can surface some signals. So hopefully that's really exciting to you, because it's exciting to me. So today I want to talk about OZ, specifically Find Your Way to OZ, the Chrome experiment that came out in February. Let's just take a look at a video of, of what the experience is like. This is all running inside the browser. And it's a, a game. There's about four games, and it's all themed around the new Wizard of Oz movie. So <clears throat> the first one is like the, the carnival cutout. You put your face into this, uh, this wooden painting, and it's using the webcam. Let me just kill the ad. Shh. So the next one is a music box. And you can actually um, kind of compose your own theme that's a lot, you know, kind of fits with the Wizard of Oz theme. And then when you, you, after you're finished, when you're walking around throughout the Wizard of Oz, the, the park, it will be playing the song that you've made. And this is using web audio. So the next attraction at the, the circus is uh, make your own zoetrope. And for those of you who are too young to know what a zoetrope is, including myself, it kind of predated animation and film, and you, you know, kind of this thing spun around in a circle and showed you a very simplistic animation, like this. And again, this is using the webcam and capturing video from <clears throat> from your computer and then putting you into the game world. The final attraction is really impressive. It's a hot air balloon ride where you have to navigate this big tornado and and you know, kind of escape, find your way to Oz. So really impressive graphics. I mean, this looks great. There's a really in-depth article on how they actually accomplished this effect. And it's, uh, it's very interesting. It kind of incorporated a lot of things from how they do uh, effects in film, where they have like a matte painting, and they're kind of composing all of these different layers together. But it's all running with WebGL. So this is Find Your Way to Oz. It's really exciting. I recommend that you check it out. Like I said, it's, been using, it's using all of the latest HTML5 features. It's using WebGL. Uh, it was developed by Unit9, and this was a partnership between Disney and Google. And Unit9 did a great job. It won a few awards. It was, it's a really exciting project. But <clears throat> late in development, there was a really serious performance problem. And it wasn't uh, a trivial problem. We were seeing something that, the, you know, we're looking at memory usage and seeing the graph along the bottom here, where we're just seeing like this sawtooth-like shape where it just keeps using more memory, and then the garbage collection kicks in and cleans it up. And no one could really figure this out. This was late. This is not good. The product needed to ship. Delays were a possibility. We really had to make sure that this, this didn't get out of hand. So. Lucky for Unit 9, they were able to call in some performance detectives. And this is Jakob and Young from the V8 team. And they were actually able to help uh, you know, kind of hold Unit 9's hand and, and figure out what was going wrong inside of their game. So what I hope that you and the audience, after uh, going through this talk, you'll be able to do the same things that Unit 9 did that the V8 team taught them. So hopefully, you all will become performance detectives by the end. So before we go into what the problem was and how we resolved it, let's spend a few minutes talking about why performance matters. So if we look at a typical frame in the browser, the first thing that happens is you have to handle input. The users click something, or they press a button. After handling input, scripts start executing. All of the, the state of the page gets updated. And actually, this often triggers a, a layout change. And so the browser has to lay out all of the elements inside the page. And then after this, it's got to paint all of the elements. They've, they've changed the contents of what's inside of there has changed. This is a lot of work. And then finally, it all gets composited onto the screen. This just loops. And you actually have to do this 60 times a second. And you have 16 milliseconds to accomplish all of this. If you don't, you're going to drop a frame. And you're going to get jank. 
So jank is this slang term for like kind of a, an unpleasant, unsmooth site experience. So when you're scrolling on a page and it kind of clips and it, it jumps, it doesn't feel smooth, that's jank. When you're playing an online game and it drops a frame or some, you know, something kind of weird happens, it pauses for a second, that's jank. And so if you miss, if you cannot get all through all of those steps in 16 milliseconds, you're going to have a janky page and users don't really like that. So where does all this performance go? Where does, where does that 16 milliseconds, uh, where does it go? So if we look at this graph here, it's kind of difficult to parse, um, but each column represents a, a very mainstream site on the web, like Google Docs or Gmail or Wikipedia or something like that. And what we really care about for this talk is the red candy, cut, <coughs> candy stripe section along the bottom. This is actually the time that your page is spending inside V8. And what we see is that you know, for Google Apps, when the, when the page isn't idle, we're actually spending between 50 to 70% of the time inside V8. And for other popular sites, it's in the range of 20 to 40%. So of that 16 milliseconds, a Google app is spending 50% of it at least executing scripts. So performance matters because you want your site to grow. You want to attract more users, and users care about the performance of site. In particular, it's been highlighted you know, in recent times with battery life. If you go to a page that performs poorly, the, the battery in your mobile device is going to drain quicker, and people are going to stop coming back because it's just not the greatest experience. Y users also want smoother applications. They want that like, smooth experience when they scroll. They want their game to run flawlessly and never have a hiccup on any frame. And they want more features. All of these things, it's actually kind of difficult to satisfy these requests because they're all sort of competing with each other. But you as the developer, you have to satisfy all of these requests. It's, you, you want to maximize battery life, you want the smoothest application, and you want the most featureful application. And without that, you're not going to see a really strong growth in the traffic to your site. So let's get back to the mystery and dig in a little bit. So solving a performance problem is actually a lot like solving a crime. The first thing you have to do is you have to dig in and get, collect some evidence and really figure out what, what's happening. And then from the evidence, you're going to find some suspects. And you're going to kind of interrogate these suspects and figure out like which one of them is likely responsible for your performance problem. And then finally, you're going to go into the forensics lab and really prove that they're responsible and dig up some information that will hopefully let you solve the crime and fix the performance problem. So let's get started on the, the, the mystery that the Unit 9 team faced with Oz. So evidence collection. You want to start off asking some pretty fundamental questions about the site that you're looking at. Um, if it's your site, then you could probably very quickly zoom through this. But if you're helping someone else, then you really, it might seem silly to start at such a basic question. But it's important to contextualize what you're doing. So the, Oz is a real-time interactive 3D game. It's taking advantage of WebGL. It has to run smooth. It has to fit that 16 millisecond time slice, or else it's going to perform badly. So the next question you want to ask yourself, are the developers following the best practices? If they're not, then the likely solution to the performance problem is probably something really simple. They, they probably just aren't aware of the best practices and are making some silly error, and it's, it's, it's great. You can fix it in no, no time. But Unit 9 are really good developers, and they were following the best practices, and they were well-read, and they were up-to-date on all of the things that you have to do to make a really smooth and you know, impressive 3D game in the browser. So, it wasn't something simple. I mean, why would I be here talking about it if it was <clears throat> such a trivial problem? So specifically, what kind of perfor performance problem are you seeing? And when you're at this stage in your investigation, you want to really kind of nail it down, because this is going to lead you to suspects. And specifically, they were seeing once per second, the frame rate dropped significantly. And to add a little bit of extra information to it, it was actually correlated with GC activity. So right when the frame rate dropped, they actually saw that the, there, there's a lot of GC activity. The garbage collector was running. So that, that gives you a bit of a clue as to like maybe wh where should you start your investigation. We're seeing a frame rate drop with GC activity. And in particular, the GC activity was massive. Once per second, 10 megabytes of garbage was being collected. 
And so you want to ask yourself, is 10 megabytes per second of garbage expected? Because in some applications, this might be, that might be a reasonable amount of garbage. In this case, it's not. There, they should be generating almost no garbage per second. And that was what the developers' expectations were. So something really strange was happening. And we really needed to figure it out. So to help us come up with suspects, we need to understand what triggers a garbage collection. Because if, if we're seeing a correlation with a performance drop with garbage collection, we have to understand why a garbage collection happens. So let's walk through V8 memory management in a bit more detail and walk through a GC pause. So to help understand the, the performance <coughs> characteristics of a GC pause, we have to understand where the cost in allocating memory comes from. And it's not in allocating the memory itself. That's actually really cheap. It's incredibly fast to allocate memory in V8. The performance problem, the, the cost of allocating memory actually comes after a while, you've allocated enough objects, and you've actually exhausted the memory pool. So at that point, the V8 runtime is forced to perform a garbage collection, and this can take milliseconds. And if we remember, like you have 16 milliseconds to get through the entire frame. You spend five of it doing a GC, you've lost your frame. You, you cannot recover from that. So V8 manages memory in a generational split. So values are split between young and old, and their age is actually kind of estimated based on the number of garbage collections in which they survive. So as an object lives through collections, it gets older. And over time, the older values are promoted from the young generation to the old generation. So the young generation uh, is, offers really fast allocation, which I've already stated. Collection is fast uh, in relation to the cost of uh, an old generation collection, uh, and it's frequently collected. When you're using the Chrome DevTools timeline panel and you see a GC event, uh, as you can see on the, the slide here, that's the young generation being collected. In contrast, the old generation offers fast allocation, but relative to young generation, the collection is slower. Luckily, though, it, it happens infrequently. Um, and part of that collection actually runs concurrently with the mutator, which is your JavaScript thread. Uh, it does some incremental marking, and there's a few different types of collections that can occur in the old generation. But typically, when, you've, when you see a frame drop in your game, or you, know, you see weird scrolling behavior, and it's a GC problem, it's the young generation. So let's really focus on that. So why is collecting the young generation so much faster? Well, to help you understand that, you have, to, you have to kind of intuitively understand that the cost of a GC is proportional to the number of live objects. So the number of objects which survive the GC is, is how you can estimate how long this GC is going to take. So because we've split the objects into two generations, the young and the old, the young kind of by definition has a very high death rate. Very few objects survive uh, many young generation collections. You know, in contrast, old generation, by the very nature of what's in the old generation, these objects have lived for a long time. So you can't expect that, hey, let's do an old generation collection. They're probably all now garbage. That doesn't make a lot of sense, because they've li historically lived for a long time inside your program. So let's look at how the young generation actually operates. So the young generation is split into two semi-spaces, equally sized, the two space and the from space. Values are allocated from the two-space, so when your JavaScript executes a new statement, new foo, it pulls some memory from the two-space. The from-space is used during GC, and we'll get to that uh, shortly. So assuming that we started with an empty two-space, it's all full of unallocated memory. Page allocates object A, and then object B, and then C, and D. Everything up until this point is great. Things are really humming along. But unfortunately, the page then tries to allocate object E. At this point, we've actually exhausted the amount of memory in the, in the young generation, and we, we cannot do this. So things back up a little bit. Object E wasn't allocated because there just wasn't room for it. The page is paused. Everything stops. The rendering stops like exactly at that line of code where you called new. Everything pauses. A collection gets triggered. So the first thing in a collection is that the from and the to space, they're just swapped. The labels are swapped. The old from space, which is empty, becomes the new to space. The next stage is that all the live values inside the young generation are discovered. These are marked 
and the next step is to copy them. And this is where a lot of the time is actually spent. It's in this copy, and this is what I said earlier, that the cost of the GC is proportional to the number of objects which survive. You have to copy these objects across from one space to the other. And this is where a lot of that time goes. So in this example, A and C survived, and we've copied them to the new two space, and here we go. The page can um, resume and allocate object E. So what you intuitively have to understand is that each allocation moves you closer to this pause. So if you're dealing with a, you know, a, something where timing really matters, you almost want to operate on, under the assumption that you cannot allocate memory. Uh, you want to kind of pre-allocate everything ahead of time. Because the collection completely pauses your application. And this brings higher latency. So just imagine that a user clicks a button, and then right then inside your click handler, you allocate some new object. Boom, you've hit a GC pause, and like, the user actually feels like, hey, I clicked. And there's just this moment where nothing is happening. And it offers a bad user experience. In games, you get dropped frames. You know, ultimately, this just leads to unhappy users who may not come back to your site. So now that we understand what happens in a GC pause and how you get to a GC pause, it's time to start looking at some suspects. And we've got these sneaky guys right here, <clears throat> blue, red, and green, who are incognito. So the first suspect that's pretty, you know, this should really jump to your mind at this point is just calling new. Maybe the Oz is calling new all the time, and they're just like allocating all these objects throughout the frame, and then like they're triggering the GC pause, and they haven't retained references to any of these objects, so they're all just garbage, and it gets collected, and that's where that 10 megs come from. So a careful audit of the code base confirmed that there was no calls to new within the frame. And actually, Uninine said that would have been really embarrassing. And this calls back to them being, they're following the best practices. They're well aware of what they should and shouldn't be doing inside their game. So suspect number two um, is code running in unoptimized mode. And let's talk about why this is a suspect. So if we look at the JavaScript on the slide, we can see that you know, there's some computation, and they calculate A and B and C, and then they you know, do some multiplication and update the X position of some sprite in the game. So in unoptimized mode, there's actually a lot of implicit memory allocations. While we don't see any calls to new on the slide, there's actually behind the scenes many calls to new, or their equivalent. So when we calculate P times D, a new object is allocated. Similarly for C plus 3 and 3.3 times DT, new objects are being allocated at each one of these points. It's not clear to you as a developer when you're looking at the code, but this is actually what's happening behind the scenes. And then even when we calculate A times B, it's not assigned anywhere, but still, memory is reserved for the result. And then the result there is multiplied with C. More memory is allocated. In contrast, if this function was running in optimized mode, there would actually only be a single memory allocation. And that's when the final result is assigned to the field inside the object. So you can see that there's a huge difference between the amount of memory that is churned through in, op in unoptimized mode compared to optimized mode. And actually, V8 recently optimized for this case. So only the first time that X is uh, updated will memory be allocated. So it's gotten even better. So let's walk through like, how you transition between unoptimized mode and optimized mode, and exactly kind of what's the state machine under the hood. So all code starts off unoptimized. That, like, the first time your function runs, it's always going to be unoptimized. That's fine. You know, after a little while, though, V8 will say, hey, this function is actually pretty hot, um, it, meaning that it's executing a lot. And it's going to attempt to optimize that function. So it's going to transition from the unoptimized state to the optimized state. But as is kind of natural in JavaScript, there's occasionally uh, some deoptimization events. Some assumption that was baked into the optimization has been violated. So then the function gets kicked back over to the unoptimized state. This is actually OK. This kind of naturally happens throughout JavaScript's uh, execution lifetime. 
And then again, after a little while, V8 says, hey, you know what? I've got some better information with this function. It's still pretty hot, so let me try and optimize it in a better way so that we can handle both of the cases that we've seen so far. Unfortunately, what happens is that after too many deoptimizations, your function actually just gets sent down to unoptimized hell, and you never get to escape. Like, once you're in this place, that's it. You're always going to run in unoptimized mode. There are also uh, other ways to get into unoptimized hell. You can use certain code constructs, and uh, we'll, we'll see an example uh, in a little bit. But if your function has a try-catch block in it, V8 today just doesn't optimize for that. So right away, as soon as the function is seen by V8, it just gets slotted into uh, you know, permanently unoptimized state, and it, it's just going to sit there. These constructs could be optimized for, but it just hasn't been a priority up to this point. So we've definitely got a potential suspect here. It's possible that some code inside Oz is running in unoptimized mode. And you know, there actually is no way to surface this using Chrome DevTools. So you can't figure out just looking inside the dev panel like, hey, this function's unoptimized. Let's fix it. So we have a potential suspect. The third suspect is a common JavaScript performance trap, and that's actually modifying object shape. So if we. V8 behind the scenes creates these hidden classes for objects. So the point constructor assigns the X field and then the Y field. And that, that order, the sequence of assigning the fields and the constructor, generates the class ID. So a little bit later on, after constructing P, somewhere in the, in the program, someone just adds a new field to the P object, which is completely fine inside JavaScript. But that, that new field inside P, that instance, creates a new class ID. And so this is going to trigger a deoptimization. So let's walk through what, kind of what happens. And this calls back to that state machine that we were just looking at. So at first, we see this point object, the, the class ID for it. And code is running in unoptimized state, because it's the beginning of execution, and that's expected. So after a little bit of time, V8 detects that some functions using point are hot, and let's optimize for them. But then the shape is modified, and this point prime class is created. So now there's two point classes kind of floating around inside the internal state of V8. There's point with x, y, and then there's point with x, y, z. So the next time uh, a call site sees this point prime class when it's expecting a point class, it actually deoptimizes. And we go across that graph back to the unoptimized state. But after a little while, the, the code is optimized to support both point and point prime classes. So again, a careful audit confirmed that there were no shape changes. And this is a really common JavaScript performance trap. And again, the Unit 9 guys were really well read. So it's not surprising that this, this was not the problem. And in some ways, suspect number three is a special case of suspect number two. So suspect number one, calling new, it's alibi. It wasn't even at the crime scene. No one was doing that. Suspect number two has no alibi. So it seems like a pretty likely suspect at this point. And the third one, suspect number three, shape change, again, not at the crime scene. So we're really narrowing in. It really seems likely that a big chunk of code is running in unoptimized mode. And now we need to get to the lab and prove this. So there's a lot of tools that you can use to help diagnose and really dig into performance problems. First is Chrome DevTools. And that's the panel that you can bring up inside Chrome. And it ships with Chrome. But this is a real performance mystery. So we're just going to jump right past it. We know we're already past Chrome DevTools. The next is about tracing. And this is a really great tool for diagnosing the internal GPU state inside Chrome and some other um, really low-level information. But again, like we're, we're past this. This is a really strange performance problem. So we've got to jump right down to the nitty gritty. We've got to go to the V8 tools. And the V8 tools actually ship with V8 source code. So if you want to use these tools, you have to go to Google Code and grab V8 and compile it, and then you get access to these tools. But as we'll see, these tools were necessary to diagnose this performance problem. So what we want to do is we want to confirm that unoptimized code is running, and then determine why that code isn't being optimized. So the first thing we want to do is we want to capture a V8 timeline. And the way you do that is you run Chrome with this crazy command line flag, Chrome, no sandbox, JS flags, Prof, no prof lazy, log timer events. Kind of strange, but it gives you a lot of really good information. 
So after running Chrome with this and you run your site for a little while, you close it down, inside the directory that you launched Chrome from will be a v8.log file. And this is a text file which you're free to open up and look inside, but it's a little bit cryptic. So V8 ships with some tools that will parse this log file and generate really useful information for you. So after running plot timer events on the log, you're going to get a PNG file that actually shows you a big timeline of the state of V8 and what's happening. So let's kind of walk through what, what's in this uh, diagram here. So along the left-hand side are um, rows representing different states that V8 is executing in. And you'll see a colored vertical tick whenever V8 is in that state. So along the top is some different garbage collector states. And I've arrowed out the scavenger. And that's the young generation collection. Along the bottom there, you can see that v8.execute state. And that is when it's just executing script code. You'll see, though, that, there, that where the blue line for the scavenger, you can actually see that there's a blank spot on the execute. And this fits with our understanding of the way GC works. When GC is active, your script isn't executing. So along the middle is this colored band showing you the code kind. And this is really helpful because we suspect that we're running some unoptimized code. And looking at the timeline, it really does look like we are. So the, the bright green is optimized code. So when you see that across, you know that everything executing across those ticks is optimized. But what we see in the graph is we see this blue, purpley kind of color. And this is a lot of, this is unoptimized code. And it's executing in different stubs and different runtime methods inside V8. So it looks like our hunch was correct. And then we are executing some unoptimized code. So if we look at the transition where we switch from a running optimized code to unoptimized code, it might be difficult to see on the slides because it's a little bit blown out. But you can actually see that there's a whole bunch of scavenges across that time slice. And you can actually see that there's little gaps in the execution that fit perfectly with when these scavenges were occurring. So here we are. Oz is running smoothly. And then we're at that one second mark. And it hiccups down. And it starts running unoptimized code for some reason. And we can see that there's all these scavenges. And this fits exactly with what we saw inside Chrome DevTools. Another uh, really helpful piece of information inside the timeline is this graph along the bottom. And this is the pause times graph. So you can see at the beginning, there's actually a whole bunch of pause times. You see these black vertical bars sticking up the bottom on the left-hand side. That's when it's parsing the script, and it's actually just getting going. And then we're in optimized function time. And you don't see any pause times there. It's just this flat curve. And then right when we transition into running unoptimized code and we see all these scavenges, we also see correlated spikes in pause times. So you can see that the scripts have stopped executing right when the scavenges occur, right when we transition to unoptimized code. So now we need to figure out what function is that. I mean, we, we've confirmed that there's unoptimized code running, but we really have to nail down who's responsible for it. So again, we run Chrome with those same command line flags. But this time, we take the V8 log, and we run the Mac tick processor. And so when you download V8 and you build it, you're going to get a tick processor for whatever platform you build it on. So there's a Windows one, a Linux one. In this case, we're on Mac, so we're going to use the Mac tick processor. When you run that on the V8 log, you actually get this nice, helpful table of functions sorted by how frequently they're seen by the profiler. So next to draw sprites, you see this asterisk. And that indicates that the function in question is optimized. But if we look at the top, this is the function that is running the most, most often in the, in the profile capture. Update sprites doesn't have an asterisk next to us. So this seems like the likely culprit here. Something in update sprites is causing it not to be optimized. And so let's try and figure out what's going on. So how can we determine why a function is not optimized? This is actually where it gets a little hairy. Um, you run Chrome with a different set of flags. You run with trace deopt and trace opt verbose. And what happens is actually a lot of text just gets dumped to the terminal that you launched Chrome from. It's just this wall of text. You likely want to pipe it to a text file and look at it later on. But digging through that, we looked for update sprites. And we actually found that, hey, here's this line that says, disabled optimization for update sprites. Reason foreign statement is not the fast case. 
seems kind of cryptic at this point, but I think once we look at the source code for update sprites, we might get a better idea of what's going on. So here's the equivalent of the problem code in Oz. We have this function update sprites, and it just iterates using a for in loop across the sprites array. And then inside of this loop, it just does a bunch of arithmetic. And if we remember earlier, when you're running in an optimized mode and you're performing arithmetic, you actually are allocating all of these objects just like for temporary values that aren't being stored anywhere. And here we see this for in statement. And this function uh, was not being optimized specifically because of this loop construct. And when, earlier, when I was showing you the diagram of the different states that your functions can be in inside V8, there, there's a way to get into unoptimized hell by just using a code construct that V8 doesn't optimize for today. It's not that V8 can't optimize for it, but it just hasn't yet. So this seems like we, we've kind of found our suspect here. It's this single line of code is triggering V8 to say, well, you know what, I, I can't optimize this. I'll just treat it as an unoptimized function. We couldn't really have this. So, ah, yes, arithmetic has implicit allocations. So the fix was actually really simple. You just move the arithmetic into its own function. And this function doesn't have the for in statement, so it can actually be optimized by V8. And we can leave that for in loop inside the unoptimized function and just call the update sprite method. So if we look at the memory usage graph before and after, we can see a really clear difference. We're no longer seeing this huge sawtooth spike up and then come down with the GC. We're seeing a nice, natural uh, growth curve, which, which you want to see. So case closed, right? I mean, we, we figured it out. But actually, the GC pause time was a bit of a red herring, because the real performance problem was that all of this arithmetic was executing in unoptimized mode. That's just significantly slower. So. The GC pause time actually led us to fixing the problem, but it wasn't the problem in itself. But it was a really, really simple fix. I mean, you saw how simple it was. Just move the loop body into its own function. It was great. But what was really helpful, and what I hope that you can take away from this talk, is that Unit 9, the developers who built Oz, they understood how to look under the hood. They understood how to pull out all this information and surface these signals inside V8. And they, on their own, without the help of the V8 team, were able to go and identify many other functions which got stuck in deoptimization hell and just generally improved the, the performance uh, of, their, of their code. So in conclusion, V8 offers three tools. There's the timeline plot tool, which is this bird's eye view of V8 activity. There's the tick processor, which is going to give you a table of hot functions. And remember, there's an asterisk next to the functions which are optimized. And if, if you are running into a similar problem, you're going to want to look for functions that lack the asterisk. And then the deoptimization log. And this actually gives you deep insight into the optimization state machine that we looked at previously. So, Solving a performance problem is just like solving a crime in real life. You first have to start with evidence collection, and it's really important to ask the right questions, because you might start going down the path that leads you to no performance improvement. After you've g collected the right set of evidence, you move on to suspects. You try and narrow it down to a few likely culprits. And then, after interrogating your suspects, you want to move on to the forensics lab and use these tools to prove your case. So, of course, you want to start with Chrome DevTools and then maybe about tracing before you get to V8. But sometimes these performance problems are so mysterious that the only way that you're going to be able to solve them is by using these, these tools that, um, that we just covered. So thank you. So don't forget to check out Perf Alley. And um, we have some, a, f a few minutes for questions, but afterwards I'll be up doing some Chrome office hours upstairs. But if you have any questions, please come to the mic. Hi. Um, so I'm curious if I used, uh, if I'd used a closure compiler to compile my JavaScript, does it automatically figure out that these constructs could lead to unoptimized code and remove them? or? 
or what happens? Um, that's actually a good question for the closure team. Uh -huh. um, but I would hope that some constructs they are aware are slower. But of course, it varies over which JavaScript engine is executing the code. Okay. Everyone has a slightly different performance so, profile. I mean, is there some or any static analysis, some kind of tool I could put my JavaScript into to tell me when I'm using constructs like this that might leave? Because it seems like this you could have cut very easily with, without actually running it, right? Well, in some sense, uh, yeah, it does kind of seem that way. But you'll note that the message was actually the foreign statement is not the fast case. So uh, the fact that it couldn't be optimized really depended on the runtime behavior. But I, I agree, it would be nice to have a static analysis tool that was kept current with JavaScript engines, because this is always changing. So you, you wouldn't want to have a tool that's a year old, because some of the advice might just be wrong. Right, OK. Cool. Hi, I'm James Hardig. Um, I was wondering, is there a way where, that you can tell V8 that you're going to allocate a bunch of objects, um, especially like if, you, if a user goes to a page where like, the developer, like we know that there's going to be thousands of objects that are going to be allocated when they visit that page. Is there any sort of way to optimize that? So um, there's no way to like kind of tell V8, like, hey, I'm going to allocate thousands of objects. Don't do any GC. But what you could do is at that initial, uh, you know, when the page is first loading and the scripts are first executing, you can pre-allocate a lot of these objects okay. and then keep them around. Okay. Thank you. So this kind of go back, goes back to the first question. Um, you said that static tools probably wouldn't be good because, I mean, the advice changes, right? I mean, the engine changes, and what was good before is no longer good. But I see that same problem with something like this, right? Like, you make that change now, but that change that you made now is no longer good in the future, right? Like, because this changes a lot, like the V8 engine, like. Yeah, so it does. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get across here is how to use these tools to uncover any performance problem, yeah. not just highlight this for in loop. Right. Do, do you think that um, V8, I, I don't know how to say this, is stable enough to like justify that? Because I mean, I wouldn't want to do something like this, which is quite a bit of investment to have like two months later. Like, I mean, it, so I don't know a lot about V8, but do you think it's stable enough to that this inve kind of investment is worth it? Well, again, this was this work was done because the performance was bad already. Uh -huh. So, I mean, that that's the first question you should ask yourself is. Are things performing fine? In which case, you should just stop because great, right. there's no problem. Um, but I, you know, V8 does change a lot, but I wouldn't expect V8 to take something that once run, ran fast and make it run slow. Okay, thanks. Hi, Adam Crabtree from LinkedIn Mobile. Um, I'm curious, what are you guys doing with the Chrome DevTools to help bring better uh, some of the heap analysis and performance analysis to, to Node.js? Because um, right now there's a lot of community projects out there that kind of attempt to do that. It would really be nice if there was a, a Google-blessed way of profiling V8 and Node.js for long-running processes and memory management. Yeah, that, that would be nice, but I'm not the right person to answer okay. that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be great, too. Actually, we have a question at the back microphone now. Uh, yeah, so these tools look really cool. Uh, I'd like to use them. I don't particularly want to download V8 to do so. Do you know if there's any plans to source this sort of information in Chrome? It seems like it would be really useful uh, in the Chrome DevTools. Yeah, there's, to see there's discussions things. about how we can surface some of these signals into Chrome DevTools or maybe about tracing so that you don't have to go and grab V8 source code. But it's going to be kind of like this, it's going to be a continuous uh, transition. So there, you could still get into situations where you know, we've surfaced a whole bunch of signals, but you still need to go and grab the tools to find that one signal that we haven't surfaced yet. But yeah, we're aware of the desire to have this stuff come up into DevTools. All right, thank you.